What's up? MCS Mahone here again with The Up Collective, bringing you yet another episode of our Blade Tips educational series, this time about jet engines. No funny or stupid introductions this time, we're just going to go straight to it, so stay tuned. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about jet engines. In particular, we're gonna be talking about the Rolls-Royce 250C28 turbo shaft engine. First, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how turbo shafts differ from other types of jet engines. So if you already know the difference between turbo jets, turbo fans, turbo props, that sort of thing, then you could go ahead and skip ahead a few minutes. If not, then let's get to the lecture. Okay, so if the turbo shaft engine of the helicopter out there didn't look like what you traditionally think of when you think of a jet engine, you're not alone. So let's start with that. Let's just say you have an airplane here. Pardon the bad drawing. Got a wing. Got a uh, big engine that looks like this. Um, if you were to, you know, draw a plane right down the center of the engine and look at it perpendicular to it, you would get a cross section of the engine. So right now we're going to explain the difference between turbo shafts, turbo jets, turbo fans, and turbo props. A turbo jet engine is the simplest. We'll call this a turbo jet. Sorry for the handwriting. I have bad handwriting. Turbo jet. Okay, it's a tube. It's a tube. That's it. Inside the tube, there is a drive shaft with compressor blades. Sorry for the drawing. This will be the only time I ever draw on this channel. And turbine blades. These are compressors, and this is turbine blades. When you, when you think of the word turbo or turbine, just think fan. It's close enough. That's basically what they are. So how this works is air enters right here and it exits right here. The compressor blades are essentially squeezing the air into a smaller and smaller space. They're pushing it uphill, so to speak. And then once it's in this tiny little space, then fuel is added, burn, combustion, boom, flame, anger, and thrust. The air is compressed, it's burned, and it's expanded. As it expands, it goes through the turbine blades, spinning them, which are mechanically connected on a drive shaft to the compressor blades, so the turbine is spinning the compressor. We're not getting any usable work from the turbine. All it's doing is spinning the compressor. So we're not getting anything out of that. The only thing we're getting is thrust out the back of the engine from adding momentum to the air, from the stored energy and the fuel. It's weird to think of fuel as stored energy, but that's actually exactly what it is. Fuel has a calorie content just like food. And fortunately, liquid dinosaurs are very energy dense. So even though jet engines tend to be extremely inefficient in their conversion of that energy into useful work, we still get a lot of horsepower out of it because there's just so much stored energy in there to be released. So we have intake, compression, combustion, and exhaust, just like a reciprocating engine, or as we like to say in aviation, suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Don't look at me like that. I didn't make that up, that people have been saying that in aviation for years. People have been saying that outside of aviation for years. So this is a basic turbojet engine. Um, Turbojets are cool because they can go fast. They can go as fast as you want, actually. I, I believe the MiG-25, one of the fastest aircraft on the planet, other than the SR-71, is powered by a turbojet engine. If you pump the fuel in, it'll spin faster and you'll go faster. Really, the only limit is at some point it spins so fast that you run into a mechanical failure or it overheats or something like that. But you, if you pump the fuel in, it'll spin faster, you'll go faster. You can go as fast as you want as long as the engine holds together. Sometimes, however, we don't care so much about going fast. We just want to be more efficient, especially if we have passengers who are paying for a, a seat. They don't really 
care about the speed as much as they care about the cost. In that case, we need to redesign our engine to make it slightly more efficient. There is a way to do that, fortunately. And what we do is we cut the front of the engine off here. And we continue the drive shaft out and put a fan like that. Fan, big fan blades on it. And what we've done is we've created a turbo fan engine. We've swapped out the word jet for the word fan. That's aerospace engineering right there, rocket science, real rocket science. I don't know what it has to do with rockets, doesn't it? But anyway, the way a turbo fan works is it's essentially a turbojet core with a big fan on the front. And what we, what we do is we end up adding a couple more turbine blades. And so how it works is these two turbine blades, the one and two, are on a, on a drive shaft that connects to the compressor and then the outer shaft on the three and four blades spins the fan. So the fan is powered by the outer turbine blades, the inner turbine blades spin the compressor, we get no usable work out of the inner turbine blades. So the, the engine core still produces thrust, we're still getting some thrust there, but the majority of the thrust is coming from the air that goes through the fan. And these are typically ducted, we have a tube on the outside of the fan that's a ducted fan. So most of the thrust is from what bypasses the engine core. The ratio of the air that bypasses the engine core to the ratio of the air that goes through the turbine core is called the bypass ratio. The higher the bypass ratio, the more efficient the turbine engine, generally speaking. Unfortunately, the fan gets bigger when you do that, and that eventually creates more drag. So you can't really go super fast with a very ultra-high bypass engine. And you also run into ground clearance problems because the engine is so large you can't hang it under the wings anymore without massive landing gear which creates its own problems. So typically you see turbo fans that, that want to go fast be medium bypass and then more efficient you'll see bigger high bypass or even ultra high bypass engines that go slower but do it more efficiently. This is not the only way to make a, a jet engine more efficient though. We can actually remove the shrouding here. And cut some of the blades off the fan and just put a propeller on there. At which point it becomes a turbo prop. Now when we make it a turbo prop, the goal is to have the three and four wheels, or however many there are, that's just an arbitrary number actually, but have our power turbine wheels harness as much energy out of the air as they possibly can because we're not really trying to produce thrust out the engine anymore, we're just trying to spin the propeller. These are typically used on slower speed engines, or slower speed aircraft rather, so we're not really worried about pushing the air out fast, we're just trying to get as much out of the, out of the air as we can with the turbine blades. So Oftentimes, turbo props don't even have an exhaust back here. They might reroute the exhaust up front and then out, or you might actually flip the engine 180 degrees so that the compressor is in the back and the turbines are in the front, and the air goes in and then reverses that way, and then you'll see the exhaust stacks out here. It doesn't really matter because you're not worried about exhausting the engine backwards because you're not really trying to produce thrust that way. The thrust is produced by the propeller. Now, what if we cut the propeller off, but we keep the output drive shaft? If we do that, now we've created a turbo shaft engine, and we can use this to power a tank or a helicopter. So, with those things in mind, now we know why the turbo shaft out there doesn't look like it produces thrust the way a typical jet engine does and it's because it doesn't. Its whole purpose is to grab the momentum of the exhaust in the air by, with turbine blades and use that to spin a, a power turbine shaft. Let's go take a look at the Rolls-Royce 250 out there to better understand this process. Okay, we're back. Now we're going to talk specifically about how the Rolls-Royce 250C28 engine operates within this Bell Long Ranger. So let's just take a quick little climb up here. Okay, to start out here, let's just talk about the main sections 
of the engine. So we have compression back here. We've got the gearbox, that's this gray box right there. We've got combustion, the turbines, and the exhaust. It goes out up there. Okay, so first off, the, the air gets sucked in there. You can see the inlet screen to keep the birds out. Then the air travels to the particle separator, which is here. The particle separator is designed to keep debris out of the engine, like dirt and rocks and that sort of thing. And the way it works is basically it spins the air up and takes advantage of the fact that dirt is heavier than air and uses its own momentum to pro propel it out these three tubes here. Once the air has been cleaned by the particle separator, then it goes through the compressor. Here you're looking at the inside of a centrifugal compressor. This one's obviously been removed from maintenance, but you can see the compressor blades there. And centrifugal just means that you're compressing the blades perpendicular to the axis of the engine. It's a little bit different than what we saw on the whiteboard in there, which was axial compression, but the end result is the same. Okay, so once we have clean, compressed air, the air is right here. At this point, the air is seriously pissed off. It is hot, it is bothered, and it is in desperate need of some satisfaction. I think we could all relate to the air at this point, at least at some point in our lives. Unfortunately, like life for so many of us, this air is not going to get what it wants, at least not for a while yet. The air is going to travel in this tube all the way back to the combustion section of the engine. At this point, at this point, the air is standing literally at the gates of hell. Like a Marine Corps recruit standing on the footsteps outside Paris Island, this air has no idea what, what's about to happen to it. It's going to get mixed with fuel, with the, uh, the fuel will come in through the back of the engine here and the ignited by the igniter, which you see there, and that is just a glorified spark plug. Now, turbine engines, the spark plug doesn't need to fire all the time like it does in a reciprocating engine. Once the flame is lit, the process is self-sustaining and the flame continues indefinitely. There is a condition known as a flame out where the flame goes out, and in that case, your engine fails. There is a mechanism called the engine relight, which attempts to light the engine automatically if that happens. And if the flame out was just a fluke and everything else is otherwise working mechanically, then the engine relight can work pretty well in restarting the engine. If you lost fuel pressure because a fuel line broke or a fuel pump failed, then you're probably out of luck. So, at this point, the air is burning and it is looking for an escape, looking for a way to get out. And it goes through the turbine section here, one, two, three, and four wheels, and then is exhausted out there. So let's just think about for a second what the state of the air is. When it's in the combustion section, it has high pressure here coming from the compressor, but just ambient pressure coming out of the exhaust. So naturally it flows from high pressure to low pressure and flows out through the turbine blades, expanding as it does. Expansion is just a decrease in pressure, the opposite of compression, essentially. There is a scenario where the airflow might try to go the opposite way, and that's if we get into what's called a compressor stall. Compressor blades, like all fan blades, propeller blades, rotor blades, are just airfoils, and they have to have their pitch angle set at the, by the engineers. They have to pick a, uh, an angle and it doesn't change. That means that under certain conditions, it's possible for the angle of attack, the critical angle of attack of the compressor airfoils to be exceeded and they can stall. If that happens, it's a bit like pushing a ball uphill and letting go of the ball. What happens? It, it rolls back downhill, right? Um, it's sort of like syphilis or, uh, or Sisyphus. I should edit that out. I'm not gonna edit that out. You should look both of those up. It'll be like uh, Greek mythology, jet engines, and a public service announcement, all in one. 
who, who would have thought? I not me. I wouldn't have thought. But uh, uh, what were we talking about again? I can't remember. Uh, yeah. Oh, compressor stall. Yeah. So if the air in the compressor is being pushed uphill, so to speak, like rolling a ball uphill. If you quit pushing it, the, roll, the ball rolls backwards. In the case of air, if the compressor blades stall, the, the pressure back here is not as high as it should be, and the air tries to go the opposite way. In that case, the engine will start popping, and it'll scare the pilot, and you'll wonder why you ever wanted to be a helicopter pilot. Fortunately, that's pretty rare. It doesn't happen very often. It only happens when you're in, you're demanding a lot of power of the engine, generally speaking, or maybe you're, you're hovering downwind and, and the wind is pushing up the tailpipe and um, causing something like that to occur. The one and two wheels here and the three and four wheels are on different shafts. The first two wheels, the one and two, are called the N1 drivetrain. Why do they call it N1? I, I don't know. It, it doesn't really matter. The, uh, the three and four wheels are on the N2 or power turbine drivetrain. The N1 drivetrain is also called the gas producer drivetrain. And I guess it's just because it, it's the drivetrain that drives the compressor and draws gas, produces gas. I don't know, engineers are weird. So there are two drivetrains in the engine, the N1 and the N2. The N1 is powered by the first and second stage wheels up here, and it runs the compressor over there. It also goes through the engine gearbox and contain and runs the everything that's required to run the engine. So the oil pump, the fuel pump, the starter generator, that sort of thing. The N2 meaning the three and four wheels here and here that runs everything else like the main rotor and the tail rotor that's the tail rotor drive shaft there it runs all the way back to the tail rotor and then the main drive shaft it travels through the engine through the gearbox and eventually to the main gearbox and then up to the rotor blades so that's where you get your useful work from is those last two, three and four wheels. It's very important that we maintain the RPM of the power turbine because it, it sets the RPM of the rotor blades indirectly. Um, and in order to do that, we use a power turbine governor, which is right here. This spins and monitors the power turbine RPM and then talks to the fuel control through these pressure lines here these pressure lines are sending a pressure, pressure signal back and forth. They're essentially talking to each other. The governor's saying, hey, I need more fuel or I need less fuel, and the fuel control unit is responding. For people my age and younger, we typically think of signals being sent by electricity, voltage that is, but voltage is just electrical pressure. So a signal that's sent by air pressure really isn't conceptually all that much different, even though it might seem a little odd. But that's how that works it's to just kind of decipher what you're looking at here pretty much all fuel and oil lines have fire shielding around them whereas air pressure lines are just hard metal lines and then everything else is electrical this is a look with the combustion section of the engine removed and you're looking at the inside of the combustion chamber there this is the burner can which goes inside the combustion section. The primary purpose of the design of the combustion section is to optimize the mixing of the fuel in the air so that it burns better, and also to keep the flame from touching the number one wheel right there because it, it'll melt if it gets too hot. Okay, so coming over to this side of the engine, um, we have slightly different things to look at. We so this side of the engine looks very similar to the other side. You can see that there is also a tube that runs all the way back to the combustion section. So the engine is essentially symmetrical in that respect. The gearbox is also on this side. The starter generator attaches to the gearbox right there. Starter generator, you can see, attaches to the gearbox right there. 
and that drives the N1 drivetrain and gets the engine started. So the, the starter generator, the reason it's a starter generator is because it's actually both a starter and a generator. It, unlike in your car, which has a separate starter motor that attaches to the flywheel and an alternator, this is a starter and a generator in one unit. And the reason we do that is just to save weight primarily, why I have two of the identical thing in the aircraft when you could save weight. A starter motor or any motor and a generator internally look very, very similar with an armature that spins um, in a magnetic field and all that. Um, it's typical of both airplanes and helicopters to have a starter and generator in one unit. And it's just a relay that's uh, triggered by a switch in the cockpit that that's picks the mode, whether it's a starter or whether it's a generator. You've got the fuel control, which is here. And as we said before, that speaks to the governor with these hard pressure lines that you see. The fuel control is kind of like the throttle because the pilot doesn't have to adjust the throttle in this helicopter. It's done automatically by this unit right here. It dictates how much fuel is actually going back into the combustion section of the engine. So really the only thing that we haven't really talked about yet is the bleed air system, which is compressed air, which we mentioned before is hot and bothered. There is also a bleed valve, which is designed to unload the compressor. It is a valve that opens and allows the compressor air to bleed off, lowering the pressure and uh, preventing a compressor stall during certain operations. The bleed valve works completely automatically. It does not need to, need to be controlled by the pilot. It's just a, a spring-loaded valve that uses air pressure to open or close. The bleed air can be used for other purposes. It can be used as heat for the aircraft and often is part of a heater for the aircraft cabin. It is possible for the heater or the bleed valve to stick partially open, in which case the, the engine won't produce as much power and it'll run hotter because the engine will be trying to dump more fuel in to produce the same amount of power. There, we do what are called power assurance checks from time to time that will hopefully catch a, a, a symptom like that. And that's essentially where the, the pilot puts the aircraft into a, a particular power condition and compares the numbers, compares the temperature and uh, gas producer RPM to certain numbers that are in the book, published numbers in the maintenance manual, and, and tries to determine whether the engine is producing the power that we expect it to. If, however, the, the engine running hotter is not caught by a power assurance check, then the pilot will notice that the engine is just running hotter in flight, in which case one of the classic pilot dramas will ensue. The pilot will land the helicopter and walk over to the maintenance department and say, hey, helicopter's broke. At which point the mechanic will say, what'd you do to it? And the pilot will say, I didn't do anything to it. I'm the best pilot in the world. And the mechanic will say, well, it wasn't broke before you flew it. What are you trying to say? I'm saying maybe if you didn't suck at flying, the helicopter wouldn't be broke. Oh yeah? Well, maybe if you didn't suck at wrenching, the helicopter wouldn't be broke. Oh, I suck at wrenching? That's not what your mom said. <laughs> this is aviation. Are you sure you want to do this? Next time we're going to talk about helicopter instruments, so be sure to hit that subscribe. Radio check. Check. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Got me? Yep. Roger. Check. Copy that.